So I'm so happy to have John Anderson joining us today. John is a mineral exploration consultant with Austrac Resources and with ideas arising from discoveries and collaborative research undertaken in South Australia by John's teams over 32 years. It's going to be great to hear why he keeps returning to South Australia. So thank you so much, John, for joining. It's awesome having you. Yeah, thanks to Cam for the, the warm up. Um, we got an email suggesting I was going to be in the hot seat um, yesterday and I was hoping the comedian would stuff it so I could claim he was in the hot seat, but it looks like it's back to me. Um, thanks, Jess, for the opportunity to uh, present in this wonderful forum and to whoever nominated me to uh, do so. Um, Friday's a golf day, so I've missed all the early geohug sessions over over the, um, the months, but uh, now with Thursday's much more can convenient um i did skip what golf one friday to listen to scott halley for a reason you'll see later on um i've been a passionate mineral explorer and applied researcher for 46 years and i'm not about to lay down in 2019 i entered the latest phase of my career in south australia by apart from working a four-day week i uh, became a first-time grandfather and i put the balance of my time into fully applying my experience to doing some good for my home state in my latter years. So I'm giving us old guys a plug today as viable players in the sage of millennials managing Gen Xs who aim to crack the discovery business with AI and crowdsource competitions, both of which I'm guilty of having dallied in recent times. My argument is simple. We stayers know a lot. We have seen cycles in funding models and tactics, and maybe most important of all, we know what we didn't know at the time when we were limited in data and tools and by the dogma of the time. But we did have questions that are now being turned into ideas as new techniques, data and discoveries emerge. And excuse me, I've just realised I've still got this silly thing on. Goodness knows what was translated there. Uh, so experience comes into play when integrating old and new data and research into new ideas and questions, sometimes not recognised by the researchers, technologists or discoverers themselves. So I present my story as an example. Today I'm taking on a particular problem for South Australia, which is not maintaining its mineral exploration spend and discovery rate commensurate with, our, with all our expectations. Despite a pioneering mining history, a world-class ISCG province and standing as an exploration jurisdiction, South Australia's share of the national spend on mineral exploration is back to about 3%. This has followed the peak of 16% due to the showcase discoveries in the noughties. The anticipated flow on of new discoveries has not eventuated under current target and tactical dogma. We cannot blame the cover forever. The Oak Dam West discovery, however, offers a belated glimpse of our future directions. Some, some things have to change, so I am proposing some new ideas and recommendations on the geoscience aspects, aspects today. With the increasing access challenges, there's even more reason to be more certain about where we want to explore. One of my argu arguments is that despite the concerted and collaborative national effort with research and data over the past decade, there is room to tailor our efforts and bring attention back to South Australia. All parties are working on objectives arising from the Uncover and Discovery CRCs. CSIRO and Geoscience Australia are, partic are particular champions with developing technologies, data and metallurgic models. Until recently, GA has been focusing on Northern Australia under their exploration for the future campaign with good industry take up. The CRCs have gra gravitated towards drilling and at rig technologies with a current rollout of min under min MinEx in the southeastern part of the state. These have been well-funded, big ticket projects that are geographically focused and support, uh, are supported mostly by large companies. I feel the lead, lead times and tenure moratoriums have been cumbersome. There must be a better way to speed up research access, access within an IP release out of tenements. Another issue is different target styles, size and depths are being sought across tenements. Majors tend to go big, deep and specific to their operational commodity. Junior exploration companies are biased towards brownfields, precious metals, and new technology metals that are understandable and popular with the investment community. There are therefore uneven target testing and research across tenements and the large areas of South Australian geology that these cover. The smaller ticket items of niche ideas and specific strategic questions should also be addressed more widely in South Australia, 
particularly coming out of industry exploration. ADIs are generally still restricted to tenement holders and their foco. There is still a lot of geoscience to be done. Here is the background to my thinking. After graduating the year OD was found and a brief stint underground at Broken Hill, I had a 13 year apprenticeship in nickel exploration in the West and tin and silver exploration in Eastern Australia. This gave me an early appreciation of the mineral system approach to exploration. I first returned to South Australia in 1988 to manage the Central Australian team in making a number of small discoveries from which I initiated early ideas that have grown and kept me attracted to the state's potential. I've applied about half my time in South Australia, even when not living in the state, as shown by the dashes on the timeline. By 1992, Aberthaw were the largest explorer both in South Australia and Broken Hill, and we earned the title of National Explorer of the Year from the Australian Register of Mining. I encouraged collaborative research and interacted with Geoscience Australia, CSIRO and universities throughout this period, then initiated MIs, MIM's entry into the PMD CRC and then, investi and then investigator into the following CRC DET and uncover, as well as submitting several PACE submissions in South Australia. One of my drivers is monitoring research developments and discoveries that can be developed into or applied to new targeting ideas or tactics ahead of everyone else. So I'm competitive. I will be describing the development of the ideas in four phases, determined by breakthroughs that created the opportunities for the next stage. These were firstly the recognition of a new model for the Mini Dam in 1993. This created new tactics and raised big questions about the connection to the IOCGs. Secondly, the confirmatory Paris silver discovery in 2011 added new information and research material to advance the model during phases three and four to a common setting and trigger for diverse deposits in the 1590 million year Gawler Craton. I'll jump straight to phase four so you know where I'm coming from. When I finished with Investigator in 2018, I was primed and in a, in a position to further scope research outcomes for, for consolidation into a series of ideas. I took the opportunity to delve into unfamiliar areas by joining the challenges, challenges of crowdsource competitions addressing exploration around Prominent Hill and in the Gawler Craton. This included exposure to machine learning. My role as chairman of the advisory board for the Institute of Minerals and Energy Resources at the University of Adelaide opened up the opportunity to join the Australian Institute for Machine Learning, AML, in our successful Prominent Hill submission. It was a simple comparison of geoscience and ML application and the judges liked our collaboration. I did form an understanding of machine learning as a promising exploration tool. However, however my analogy of doing M machine learning without a domain expert is like doing Wordle without knowing English, but I'm sure my data science colleagues will prove me wrong one day, maybe. I teamed up again with Emil for the Gawler Challenge in the Western Gawler. However, I decided the competition needed reminding there was a big, still a big future in new geoscience thinking, including so-called brownfields areas and using old data. So I selected the Stewart Shelf District for another submission that built on my decades of thinking and a prior study by the Geological Survey, GSSA, as you'll see it on the slides. I did have some credentials with three visits to Olympic Dam and oversaw a limited copper exploration at Emmy Bluff while with MIM, but the real opportunity was, a look, was to look at others' data differently based on the learning 300 kilometres away to the south on the other side of the Craton. Although I was pleased with the results, it did not go far under the competition's objective of finding machine learning applications for the new Gawler, Gawler uh, airborne uh, data. Yeah, this, this presentation is another opportunity to clarify the process whereby I develop the ideas and views about how exploration and research can progress in a large part of South Australia. The, the hypothesis is a single big bang that triggered a metallogenic event at 1590. This created a spectrum of diverse deposit styles, some of which may not yet be detected. Using the mineral system approach designed for the OME, we can integrate all the ideas and data to prioritise research questions and avenues to determine the best places to explore and how to explore. The aim is to develop a roadmap, or preferably an innovation map that is tailored to South Australia. An early attempt is shown here for the IME is submitted to the 2019 review by the Productivity Commission. Once again, I may have been spruiking in the wrong corner of the park. So I had another go at this in the 2021 Hildebrand workshop. The text colors identify related research topics. 
all the revelations outside the Venn diagram came from the ideas and collaborative research driven by our team's exploration around Menini, Nankerville and Paris. Inside the VED diagram, the relevant step changes for different research disciplines are drawn together. The goal is to fill the, the innovation gap or the hub in red in the middle. So how did this come about? The first phase was my return to South Australia to explore for mineral sands and broken hill style deposits in the Willy Armour and Gorda Craton. There was considerable collaborative research with Syro and Coes with whom I had made strong connections during my Eastern Australian work. The initial reason for my return was a suggestion I made at a project generation meeting in, 18, in 1986. Aberfoyle decided titanium was desirable and mineral sands was the best source. However, they had been unsuccessful in, secure, in securing land on the east coast of the, Australia. So we were asked, where could the company go to look for mineral sands? With an upbringing in Narracourt where the caves in the, in the Gambia limestone turned me into a geologist and grandparents on a farm in the swales of the upper southeast, I proposed the fossil beach strands of southeast South Australia, quite naively, I must say. Within 12 months, Mark Tickle had discovered Mindery. This was before the announcement of WIM 150 that subsequent pundits incorrectly recorded as the trigger for mineral sands exploration in the South Australian Murray Basin. It may have been the case for others. That input combined with my broken hill experience landed me the role of regional exploration manager for Central Australia in 1988. The Angus lead discovery came in 1992 with the, under the very edge of the preserved Murray Basin. The Angus deposit sat under thin cover of Gambia limestone, Gossens and Garnite, uh, Garnet rock at the unconformity predicated the discovery using BHT principles well before drilling. Steve Totef made the key initial inputs here. Although the BHT model is challenged, I note GA is still listed as such. Regardless, the empirical model worked and the discovery showed once again our industry has been poor exploring through even thin cover. The reality is these rocks would have interested any Broken Hill geologist traveling to Victor Harbour for holidays, but no one looked and the offset extensions to the 1848 lead and silver mines remained dormant until 1992. Both Angus and Mindery were mined. However, we made two smaller discoveries in Northern Air Peninsula, including just an altered outcrop that had and still has potential to, to make a great impact. I farmed Aberfoyle into Mini Dam lead zinc prospect in 1988. Shell had made the initial lead zinc discovery around 1890, 1983 by the same team I had worked with in a joint venture looking for tin around Ardlethan in New South Wales. They offered me the job of managing Minini Dam. Instead, I farmed in. Both companies had a firm BHT model based on lead isotope ideas at the time. Aberfoyle continued to find the other 85% of the resource using BHT principles. The first clue it was something else was the lack of metamorphosed sulphide textures. I argued remobilization. The second was an outcrop I discovered around 1990 at what I named Nankerville Hill, about 50 kilometres to the west. It was mismapped on the government sheet as dolomite in the expectation it was part of the regional stratigraphy. It is a silicious rhyolite breccia with 30% interstitial ammonite. I was living near Tamora when the Gijimbung gold deposit was found, so I knew the significance of alunite. The third clue was when we offered Manini as a test bed for an Amara shootout of remote geochemical techniques aiming to detect mobile ions through the GRV cover. Conventional digestions work best. In 1993, the light bulbs lit, lit when we found mineralization associated with a subvolcanic collapse breccia at the south end of the prospect. These were altered and unaltered, sorry, they were altered and unaltered GRV dikes. This was similar to the setting at Ardleth and Tin Mine, often referred to as a tin porphyry deposit, earning a visit from Richard Sulito. Everything changed every overnight, including my job prospects after 19 years with Aberfoyle. So that was the first major breakthrough leading to phase two. The GRV was part of the, min, was part of the mini dam mineral system. The mineralization was most likely synchronous with the GRV. This opened up a raft of new questions and possibilities where they were addressed with internal and collaborative research. I farmed MIM back into Nankerville and White Dam to finish the copper gold discovery. Roger Skiro of GA studied White Dam and determined it was a biotite hosted equivalent of an IOCG. The period with MIM was valuable for other reasons as it exposed me to exploration right into the portal shafts and open pits of major mines, including Ernest Henry. I also visited numerous porphyry coppers and nephrothermals in South and North America, along with visits to many of the Zambian copper mines. 
this overseas exposure lay the foundation for some of the key outcomes in the Gawler. The new model raised the prospects for an Olympic mega metallogenic event that spanned the GRV massive. The arising questions were, were Mini Dam and Nankerville the same age as Olympic Dam? Did the alunite have an epithermal and porphyry association? Was there a tectonometallogenic connection across the GRV? How did the Hiltaba granites relate? Was there a stratigraphic marker within the GRV recording the OME? Were, the, these, were there deposits under the GRV massive? On geological grounds, did the associated, associated granite diorite at Nankavu relate to the St. Peter subduction sweep? If so, where was the subduction? I've taken three companies into the Nankerville district to apply spectral mapping and regional soil geochemistry in pursuit of epithermal deposits. MIM, MIM undertook early PEMA mapping at Nankerville to confirm the alienite was associated with a zoned advanced sigillic assemblage of porophyllite and dickite. Topaz was added later. MIM dropped the Nankerville project in the cutback and, and major companies ran calcrete over the area without success. On departure from MIM, I re-pegged the area and went through a series of juniors doing the next industry phases of ISCG gravity targeting and uranium exploration before investigator regained control in 2009. This finally resulted in the Paris discovery in 2011 and confirmed the model and tactics originating back in 1993. You can see how our approach was to undertake soils on a one kilometer grid then infill to 250 meter spacing. spacing. At that stage, with money running out, I took a punt on recce drilling various anomalies with Air Corps in early 2011. Three holes went into Paris on anomalous sample points with a marginal hole achieving 90 grams of silver. We bit the bullet again, infilled the soils to 100 metres and produced the coherent anomaly shown here. We then Air Corps the target on a 50 by 100 metre grid, achieving numerous intersections, including a hole finishing in 1,000 grams silver. Many people contributed with um, to the early stages, and I see Barry Willits online, so hello Barry, uh, and Richard Hill st stuck with me through the difficult financial times to complete the uh, discovery. The soil geochemistry also led us to mismapped and unmapped outcrops of mineralized dikes nearby. Many of the outcrops have been, had been mapped as Lincoln complex, a grab bag for everything that didn't, did not fit the dogma of a Broken Hill style stratigraphy. The upshot was our remapping and government dating showed the Lincoln complex covered about one and a half billion years of earth history. The follow-up diamond drilling of two holes achieved 11 meter, meters at 3,600 grams per tonne silver. The drilling also identified the key ingredients of a sequence of cross-cutting rhyolite dikes, for which the latest Sin Min phase is a partially brecciated fluorite bearing pepperitic dike. We raised quite a bit of money and started rebuilding the company in 2012. Paris turned out to be a flat-lying, tabular, highly clay-altered breccia body situated at a collapsed contact between the carbonate basement and basal GRV. All these ingredients in the wall rock of graphitic metasediments fit the characteristics of an intermediate sulfidation epithermal deposit. The carbonate alteration is manganiferous and included rhodonite, the one broken hill mineral we did not identify at Angus. Sorry, yeah, Angus. Jason Murray and Andrew Elisi took us through the th three resource estimates, achieving th for about 42 million ounces of silver at good grades. The Paris deposit offered further research opportunities to apply precise dating to test the timing under the OME model, plus accurate pathfinder geochemistry to expand the search tactics agnostic to the expanding spectrum of styles. Integration with other breakthroughs, such as the use of MT to map mineral systems and the review of drainage geochemistry under new concepts, also expanded the search tactics over the past decade. A particular interest was geological developments at OD, where it became clear the copper mineralization is preferably in a sericite fluorite rim to the barren hematite core, a point that arises with Oak Dam West and Emmy Bluff discoveries. But first of all, the Paris Nankerville system is an example of an expanding spectrum of OD aged deposits, as I've already said. The precursor subduction Monza granodiorite is overprinted by all the elements of an epithermal porphyry system as seen on the silito diagram a lithocap, propolytic, and advanced sigillic alteration at Nankerville, a copper gold scarn at Helen, and the satellite intermediate sulfidation silver deposit at Paris. Rhyolite dikes have a key role in connecting the deposits. 
Three 200-meter RC holes were drilled into the property alteration at Nankerville in 2018 with promising pyrite and molybdenum and tellurium and bismuth uh, zonations. However, this determined any porphyry vein system is likely to be at 300 meters or four to down to 1,000 meters deeper in the system. Collaborative dating also connected the different deposits. Precise dating of the Paris dike samples by Justin Payne showed both the precursor Hildebrand granite ages for early dikes and a 1590 age for the proposed Sin Min dike phase. This corresponds with the accepted age for the OD mineralization. Secondly, coarser argon argon dating of the Nankerville Alienite by the Geological Survey incorporates the 1590 OD age. And unpublished data of the Nankerville Monza diorite, Monza granite diorite, confirmed the long anticipated St. Peter's age of around 16, 20 million years. So with close ages for mineralizations either side of the 300 kilometer wide GRV massive, the question was what are the connections between the deposits? One clue was the precise dating of the GRV done by the survey, whereby the Batali rhyolite surrounding Paris is dated as being at the transition between the lower and upper GRV. This dating was the first evidence of a regional trigger and rapid, rapid formation of the IME deposits. Although there have been skeptics, we came, came to the view that the UNO fault was a major structure into which the upper GOV thickened dramatically. The localization and mineralization along the fault also implied a connection. The lack of mineralization in the well exposed upper GOV also supports the main mineralizing event being at the top of the lower GOV. With the paleo surface and Batali rhyolite as the likely candidates for the mid GRV marker of the IME, the investigation, investigator exploration team went looking for the marker elsewhere in the craton. Regional support for the marker was recognised with Dave Hopton in 2015 at the Red Lake Prospect near Punt Hill, where a 22 metre thick unit of conglomerate logged in 1981 consists of angular volcanic clasts and rounded quartzite cobbles. It is probably ignobritic and needs more study. The marker is recognised in three adjacent holes and thickens to the north. It represents a major tectonic uplift with exposure of the basement north of the holes and is the likely upper limit of OME mineralisation with a progression from sporadic hematite down to magnetite alteration in the copper mineralisation in the basement. The best fit for these data is a unifying super caldera model. This concept was proposed in 2016 after the first precise states were released for the GRV. Under this model, early Hildebrand granites were in place prior to the cooled era collapse, while the UNO fault margin has the even earlier St. Peter subduction granodiorite. A rapid change to extension triggered the cooled era collapse in an OME. Mineralizing dikes and cupolas telescoped into the cooled era shoulders. The postulated mid GRV stratigraph stratigraphic marker of the IME is represented as the orange dashed line. ISCGs formed on the northeast shoulder while epithermal porphyry deposits formed in the prior subduction terrain on the southern shoulder. The pattern of gravity gradient strings support the caldera outline. In plan, the OME deposits are closely associated with conductive corridors mapped by magnetotellurics, MT, at the mantle interface. Detailed MT surveying maps flares rising under OD and associated prospects. Such flares are now identified at other major ICG deposits, including Ernest Henry. The MT depth slices add another ingredient to a possible tectonometallogenic mechanism for the OME. So back to the 2020 uh, study, um, in the uh, Explore SA competition, which is phase four of the work, uh, commencing around 2019. So this is the area shown here. It corresponds with a, a study done by the, um, the survey back in 2013, providing very useful information. But first of all, I'll look at evidence of this being a cold era margin. Of immediate interest, and support of the Caldera model, model is the partitioning of the hematite ISCGs up on the shoulders, whereas the magnetite dominated deposits form within the Caldera, presumably due to hotter conditions under a thicker GRV blanket. A similar relationship is shown between OD and the Acropolis, with the latter magnetite mineralization within the Caldera and the OD hematite ISCG up on the shoulder. Using the survey study holes, a composite section was constructed 
running from Red, Red Lake, then north to Winjabi, still in the Caldera, up onto the shoulder towards Emmy Bluff and onto Cam Sim and Carapatina. The Emmy Bluff fence had to be corrected and raised due to a thick accumulation of Pandara, suggesting a post-min movement that fully preserved Emmy Bluff and Oak Dam West. The section shows the interpreted connection between the postulated OME marker and the collapse of ferruginous sediments and conglomerates into the hematite OCG breccias from the paleo surface on the Caldera shoulder. Oz Mineral reports inclusions of volcanogenic quartz conglomerates similar to the Red Lake conglomerate deep within most of its deposits. Of interest are the logs of a transition from the Emmy Bluff deposit up into the Pandara. Is there a 1587 million year proto Pandara that infilled and preserved the deposits immediately after the breccia collapse? It's a hot question, I believe. Geochemistry remains a key input even at the techno-metallogenic techno scale. After Cathy Stewart left MIM in 1997, I co-funded her Hildebus study with John Foden. This is my take on some of the results with two parallel belts of crustal source granites. The GRV may be hiding a physical connection, however, other evidence supports the separate belts. Another data set of use is the National NGSA Drainage Survey. I interpret the data as showing South Australia is consistently and nationally anomalous in a number of elements that are considered pathfinders to ISCG systems. Analysis again show a pattern of two northwest oriented belts of anomalous catchments. This pattern is consistent with the prior MT corridors at 30 kilometres depth. The distribution of fluorite saturation in the CSIRO hydrochemistry data also shows a similar pattern, provides the added bonus of, of supporting a pre Adelaidean rift reconstruction that places, firstly, Broken Hill in the southern belt, and secondly, extension of the prominent hill Olympic Dam IOCG trend into the northern part of the Kernamona. The latter is a refinement of the MT based model of the ICG belt proposed by Skiro and co workers. Putting all these ideas together, I arrived at the following hypothesis for why the OME is so rapid, large, and diverse. A double subduction model is proposed for the initial compression stage corresponding with the first collision of the North, North Australia plate with the South Australian plate. This produced supermetasomatism of the mantle. Broken Hill, whether sin sedimentary or an OME scan, is South Australian after all. Early extension produced two parallel belts of anomalous early Hildebrand granite, supported by numerous geochemical and MT patterns. Overprinting translithospheric corridors tap the mantle metal sources. The su a super caldera collapse triggered the OME with the release and focusing of fluids and metals into the rapid formation of ICG CG deposits in the northern belt and epithermal porphyry deposits in the southern belt is determined by precursor subduction conditioning. The caldera was subsequent, subsequently infilled by post-OME upper GRV and possibly rift sediments of the proto-Pandara. Low sulfidation epithermals overprinted the caldera system around 1570 million years, example being the Tarkula gold prospects. Adelaide, Adelaidean rifting rotated Kernamona anti-clockwise relative to Gaula. Now for a change of pace, as we look at what else the Paris discovery has taught us. During a metallurgical study, Scott Halley pointed out the Sin Min Rhyolite dikes subsequently dated as OD age, have depleted zirconium characteristic of a very prospective metallogenic vent. The mineralized breccias in orange show mixing between the higher zirconium hafnium ratios of the hosts and the lower signature of the rhyolites. This raised the question of whether a mixing model could be applied to measure the degree of hydrothermal alteration in diverse country rocks. There is, a research, there is research support for zirconium depletion in hydrothermally altered zircons, whether magmatic and igneous rocks or multi-provenance in metasedimentary rocks. The opportunity is to have a simple whole rock measure of alteration. A universal geochemical ge pathfinder is therefore proposed for the IME, whereby the hydrothermal fluids from the fractionated intrusive sources overprint and change the zircon compositions. This is measurable with, with modern whole rock analyses. The zircon alteration index was introduced as 40 minus the zirconium to hafnium ratio to achieve a positive alteration scale increasing from, from zero to 20. The data from the Geological Survey's 2013 Stuart Shell study were used to evaluate the ZAI, mo ZAI model. The survey undertook an excellent geochemical survey of 35 holes. They established a Pathfinder Prospectivity Index, PPI, using an algorithm of 11 classic Pathfinder elements. Analysis of the survey's probability 
probability plots shows pathfinders like cerium and, and uh, selenium are, are dependent on the style and intensity of alteration and therefore more closely represent mineralization. Whereas the zircon hosted zirconium and hafnium have much more even and linear distributions across sericite, chlorite, and iron oxide altered rocks and further down the scale of alteration intensity. The systematics of zirconium and hafnium in zircon there are, therefore offer a more suitable platform for whole rock alteration measurement. The ZAI ratio normalizes the zircon variations in hosts into readable downhole profiles, whereas other pathfinders have spiky distributions and lower correla correlation coefficients, more in keeping with mineralization. ZAI is, a pow is powerful when combined with the strato tectonic model. The hole we were just looking at intersected magnetite hosted copper mineralization associated with rhyolite dikes. The dikes have ZII's approaching 20, like at Paris. The altered and mineralized metasediments show a progressive ZII trend to about six near the dikes. This is good support for ZII as an alteration measure. A single hole at Chianti also shows low ZII values for the nominal upper GRV, whereas the marker has elevated ZII's around five, with gradual reduction down through the lower GRV and basement. The orderly profile supports the concept of analyzing the stratotectonic profile with ZII. The interpretation here is that the marker and lower GRV are proximal and lateral to mineralized hematite basement known but nearby. Examples for more proximal and downwards vectors came from established deposits like Carapatina. Here is the first hole drilled off the main gravity anomaly by a few hundred meters. There is a strong ZII signature with increasing downhole trend. The subtle copper and silver values become of interest. Emmy Bluff continues to give with ZAI anomalies in, in the marker, vectoring towards stronger and deeper ZAIs in the hematite breccia. The overlying Pandara was logged as transitional with the marker here. So the anomalous ZAI values in the Pandara as a cam sim may be primary. This has significant exploration ramifications. The established deposits were used as templates to determine a preliminary target proximity scale for ZAI values and 2D target vectors for the ZAI, ZAI profiles down the holes. The aim is to have broader alteration vectors rather than solely relying on classic pathfinder elements, gravity anomalies and iron oxide alteration that need to be closer to mineralization. Holes rated as proximal and shown as orange on the plan are likely to be within five kilometers of the, of the center of a hydrothermal system and possibly as close as fi 500 meters and therefore are worthy of follow-up. Holes with distal or remote ratings are still useful in guiding target vectors for adjacent holes. Where possible, the 2D ZII vectors of single holes were upgraded to 3D vectors by either ZII analysis of adjacent holes, location relative to the caldera margin, or proximity to magnetotelluric conductors. Of the eight targets recommended for review, three had no 3D assistance. The best targets have MT support, as at Emmy Bluff, with the Arcuna gravity complex within the Arcuna gravity complex that includes Oak Dam West. Both deposits have potential fluid con conduits mapped by MT pipes and perturbations in the gravity gradient strings. Emmy Bluff Deeps is analogous to Oak Dam West, West with historic logs recording what is now interpreted as the upper copper pore ferruginous Mars sediments collapsed into the hydrothermal breccia with mineralized flanks, an annular, pat uh, an annular pattern around a barren hematite core as seen at Olympic Dam. The OME model presented here offers an expanded spectrum of hydrothermal deposit styles rapidly formed by a single tectonic mechanism. Accordingly, target areas can be more precisely selected with the added potential for an expanded exploration space away from the previously perceived IOCG belts. The other concept to propose today is a simpler whole rock pathfinder tool, pathfinder tool that uses the universal platform of zircon hosted elements to measure the degree of alteration with more certainty and further out from hydrothermal centers and agnostic to deposit styles. You cannot escape geology and good exploration. So the ZII numbers gain real meaning when compared with the stratigraphy down hole and across holes. This provides a stronger 4D target vector that can prioritize gravity anomalies or encourage detailed MT or other geophysical surveying close, both in historic IACG districts and in new areas with hydrothermal potential. So under recommendations, strategic analysis of research, research questions, opportunities and coordination is an important first step. Hopefully I've thrown up some new ideas today. Undertaking long-term headline studies directed by large, well-funded companies has its place as long as it's done efficiently without tying up land. 
there is a place for sharp research addressing specific questions that will quickly answer strategic questions. In this regard, there are new incentives for strategic drilling, preferably with techniques that will provide reliable samples for four acid ICP analysis. There is a clear need for additional precise dating with key questions identified for such dating. A local lab is desirable and preferable in a commercial environment as, a global, as, as the global porphyry explorers are also requesting in their operating centres. And regional geochemical data sets still have a place and should be reviewed and infilled where anomalous in pathfinders. Here is an example of reassessment of the extent and anomalism of three NGSA catchments um, in the uh, Delamarian. The Angus and Karunda catchments have comparable lead and cadmium signatures for many of the nine permutations of, the, of sample depth, size fraction and digestions. Interestingly, Angus does not drain into the Bremer catchment, but Kaman 2 does whereas the Reedy catchment has one of the strongest copper gold signatures in Australia. I feel there's a lot of information here warranting follow-up follow with detailed catchment sampling to trace the sources in all three catchments. The same applies to anomalous catchments on the Gawler Craton. What is extra to last year's presentation is the use of various combinations of the proposed tactics, depending on data availability, to identify numerous target areas in addition to the eight on Stuart Shelf, but also in the Southern GRV and now extended to the idea and now extended to ideas for the Camman 2 Delamarian under thin covered margins of the Western Murray Basin. The point I want to make here is most of the target areas are tied up in large mineral tenements and government moratorium areas reserved for research. Maybe there could be more government liaison with tenement holders on ideas and opportunities, opportunities that are worth, worthy of testing or of new partners. And you, if you think that's difficult, how about getting investors behind innovative mineral exploration? So thank you very much for listening. Uh, sorry I had to read all that, but I had too much in my head. Um, I, I'm uh, very pleased to be able to deliver this once again, and um, I look forward to some interest. So um, thanks very much, Jess. I'll hand it back to you. Thank you so much, John.